All right, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, today's staff B call, I think there's a couple new people. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, this is the State Public Health Bioinformatics Workgroup, and we're just the consortium of public health scientists all working uh, on the common challenges to integrating bioinformatics technologies. Uh, and today we have with us uh, Nick um, from Maine's Public Health Lab, and uh, we're gonna be focusing on uh, definitely a pressing issue across uh, public health laboratories in terms of gaining the CLIA accreditation uh, for bioinformatics workflows. Uh, we also have on the call with us today Jonathan Jacobs from CLC uh, Genomics Workbench Dev Team or Global Product Management Team. Sorry if I got that wrong there, Jonathan. But um, So welcome to the call, uh, both you guys. Um, Nick, with that small introduction, I'm just going to go ahead and mute myself and let you take it away. Hi, thanks very much. Um, so yeah, so I'm Nick Metluck. Uh, I work at the Public Health Lab up at the state of Maine. Um, uh, on the first slide here, uh, you'll notice there's no bioinformatics uh, title, uh, more of a biochemist, bioterrorism uh, type person for the state. Um, and uh, I'm going to go through sort of what we've done for CLIA, not just for CLC Bio, while that's a big part, but other sections as well, including, including some wet bench chemistry type validations and QA and QC uh, stuff. Um, so just uh, some housekeeping up front, uh, funding, we do get funding through the ELC and the FEP grant through federal CDC. And in 2015, we got about $80,000 to sequence and analyze about 500 sequences of um, HAI organisms and do a sort of report out um, not in a journal article, but sort of like a state of the state resistome study for the um, hospital acquired infections program here. Um, we do have two aluminum ice seeks purchased in uh, 2016 and 2018. We did an attempt to uh, demo nanopore, but uh, we couldn't, uh, in order to access Metrochlor, uh, Metrochlor, we would have to basically disable our firewall so that sort of uh, uh, was shot down uh, from the get go. Uh, we have four PulseNet certified technicians, and we only use Nextera XT protocol, not flex kits or anything else. And uh, we do have an in-house modification for gram positives on that. <clears throat> uh, so uh, here I'm just going to go through briefly what we offer here at the state. Um, CLIA uh, did uh, accept all of our validations last year when they were here doing our, our biannual audit. So we do use Center for Genomic Epidemiology. Um, we do use the NIH uh, uh, web app, Patrick, for assembly and some other things. But the big one is CLC Bio, so we have dedicated workflows for uh, SNP tree analysis, uh, Seminole Paratyphe B tartrate positivity, and then a big uh, protocol for uh, resistance genes, virulence genes, uh, metagenomic contamination that we may see here at the laboratory, um, MTB functional mutations, uh, that protocol, the wet bench protocol, was uh, provided to us by Wadsworth. Um, and then we do do serotyping. So while not all serotyping uh, done at the lab is through whole genome sequencing, such as uh, Pseudomonas, Strep pneumo, H. flu, and Neisseria meningitidis, we decided to just validate they, those just in case they were needed. Um, but we do uh, also the uh, PulseNet organisms, Salmonella and E. coli as well. Um, so this is our basic theory that we came up with a couple years ago with an old QA officer of how we validate anything in the house. Um, so because all the uh, web versions or software versions or whatever change over time, we're only going to validate and, and sort of review any components that we're using that actually have an impact on what we're doing. For example, if I'm using for CLC Bio has great RNA seq software that we might be able to use, but because we don't use that, if they are able to ever send an update, we're not going to have to revalidate all of our workflows because anything having to do with RNA-seq is not present in our workflows. So we're only going to sort of review and maybe revalidate anything that's actually applicable to our work. If CLC decided to say, we're going to go to version 9 of their assembler and I use version 6, I might have to do a complete revalidation of our workflows. Um, and then we also don't validate to a gene or sequence, but actually to a database instead. Uh, and this is because we're dealing, you know, there's millions and millions of genes, there's millions of bacteria. So when we're doing, say, antibiotic resistance, I'm not going to say, in this organism, I can see these three genes. I'm going to say, in gram negatives or gram positives, this is the database I look at. 
for these genes. And then we take a sort of a, a plethora of organisms that may have a different uh, variety of those genes and validate to that. That way, if the database itself is ever updated with, you know, variant number 602, I don't have to revalidate the entire database. And then same way when we do um, uh, genus and species taxonomy for bacteria, we're not going to this, we're not validating to the species level, even though we reported out, we're validating, can we extract and see gram positives, gram negatives, mycobacterium. Uh, eventually we're gonna do some metagenomic work and we're gonna uh, see if we can, you know, go down to the enveloped, non-enveloped viruses, et cetera. Uh, obviously for tuberculosis, we did a different type of validation for uh, uh, mutational analysis where we actually ran um, in silico and wet bench uh, uh, samples that had no mutations and how to get those specific mutations out. Um, <clears throat> so because we're under, we put everything we do under CLIA, um, uh, I sort of broke out sort of some of the things that bioinformatics has that uh, falls under pre-analytical, analytical, and post-analytical. I'm not gonna go through everything here because you'll have access to my slides, but basically very briefly, pre-analytical would be like all the calibrations that we do and the competencies and the PTs that CLIA requires. The analytical work would still be some extra PTs, um, predefined QA and QC metrics that have to be met at different stages of, of uh, running our samples. Um, and then post-analytical, we store all of, our, all of our data. Luckily, we're a low incident state, so we just use two external hard drives that are about four terabytes piece. Um, everything's thrown under QA manual. Um, we do some risk assessments, and we also did CLIA's IQCP protocol as well. Um, and we also, and I'll talk about it later, where we have an incidental findings committee. Um, so some QC metrics, because I want to know if you have garbage at the beginning, you have garbage data at the end. So everything here we sort of keep track of in some sort of worksheet that we can have an audit trail for. So CLIA could say, you know, on sample number 412, please show me all documentation and all the QA metrics for it. Um, I won't go through all of that, but because you have it right here. Um, and then we also, using CLC Bio, we also do uh, uh, metagenomic analysis, just looking for contamination, and our rate is, uh, you know, anything above 5% for different genus species, we would have to resequence. And this is, um, this database is unique to our lab. It's probably similar to any public other, uh, other public health labs if they had it, because it's really just um, using all the pulse net organisms, so we have a between five and 15 different um, uh, uh, reference sequences for Salmonella and E. coli and Listeria and Campylobacter and Vibrio. And that way, you know, if, if and we've actually had to use it a couple times where we go and we look at the, you know, amount of genome coverage we see just straight off the sequencer, you know, should we see something about 5 million base pairs? And if we're getting out, you know, just using the general math that we're seeing something at 9 million base pairs, what happened? Did we, do we have two different isolates? Is there a mix up? Did we combine samples? And lo and behold, one time we found out that there was a mix up and two isolates were actually side by side and they were picked and one was a Klebsiella and one was an E. coli and they prepped them up that way. So we were able to break it out and just go back to stock culture from there. And then we also have predefi predefined uh, uh, metrics for uh, a set, whichever assembler we use. And then reference assemblies through CLC Bio. Uh, reference sequence used, fractions of reference covered and average covered. And we keep track of all this in some massive um, Excel database. This is just sort of a snapshot of a couple of different things. You can't read anything, but that's not the point. The point is this, uh, this big QA worksheet is about 800 rows long and maybe about 40 columns wide and it's all color coded so people can easily take a look at you know what runs were uh, uh, good what runs were bad or maybe according to fast QC analysis the run was okay but a particular sample down the line failed why did that happen so it's sort of like a running tally of all the metrics from the MySeq and any bioinformatics software that we use easy way to just look over time what's happening so the most basic of QA and QC that we do is this chart right here. Um, a lot of this is, is taken from PulseNet, and we have some, you know, what type of testing is allowed based upon general genome coverage before we do any analysis, just so we can sort of get the ball rolling. Because the turnaround time for whole genome sequencing is an issue for epidemiologists, so you sort of try and go as fast as possible. 
Um, so just looking at here, you know, we have you know less than 20 fold coverage, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, and greater than 40. Um, you know, and as you obviously as you increase in the amount of fold coverage, you can sort of do more and more testing. Um, one of the risk assessments that I used to do in biotechnology, was, uh, biotech was something known as failure mode effects analysis. This is what NASA used to put the space shuttle into space, and it's really looking at the example would be, I need to screw two pieces of metal. Where did and you go down to where did the ore come from to make the metal, and what could happen all along the supply chain to putting it in space? And you know they had millions and millions of pages of this, so we sort of use this to monitor some sort of risk assessment. So we look at item function. So a reagent could be whatever reagent. How could it fail? Uh, what is the potential effective failure? And th our, this for that we did for the MySeq and bioinformatics, I think it's about uh, seven or eight pages long of risk assessments. And then we look at the, the cause of failure, you know, was the reagent expired? Was it stored in the wrong temp? Maybe it was contaminated. And then what current design controls do we have in place now? We have, you know, we have lot numbers, we have positive negative controls, expiration dates, we have worksheets where everything's recorded. We check fridges and freezers. Um, and then you're given, a, you know, given three different data points, severity, probability, and detectability. So on a scale of one to 10, one being terrible, 10 being great, how, how well or how, what's the risk? So if, you know, if a PCR reagent uh, uh, it doesn't work, the severity is pretty high because I can't run the test probability of it happening if it's expired is low because we record all of our, our expiration dates. I can easily detect it because I'm actually recording it. So then we get a, a number on the sign and depending on the number, we may or may not have to do something. Um, and then down below, uh, you can see we also do QC metrics and reporting. It was interesting, so we put right out of the gate, we have a really, really low or really low risk number, meaning we have a high risk that when we brought this on about three years ago, no one knew anything. So then uh, I had to go out and sort of do some outreach with other laboratory staff, some other reference laboratories in the state, and um, epidemiologists in the state to sort of talk about and sort of train them to, so they were competent enough to sort of understand some of the, the reporting data that's going on. Not so much that the protocols or the QA or the QC that's happening, but when I say I found Sequences indicative of seminal, or what does it actually mean? Um, so, going on some of our way, we do sample proficiency testing and competencies. So, these are some these are some sample questions from uh, I think last year from one of our in-house written TTs that I did. They sort of state that you know we're all we're going to use CLC Bio. Sometimes I can say you know you can use whatever program you want. In this case, it was just CLC Bio, and we sort of go down the list. You know. I want to know what's the purpose of DNA quantification. And then I say, you know, uh, another question is, you're analyzing virulence factors for bacillus cereus. Uh, blast analysis reveals three genes, uh, three toxin genes. And I want to know what the technician needs to do when they find that um, there's anthrax plasmids in bacillus cereus, and there's a protocol for that that they need to know. Um, and then I want them to describe in paragraph format, you know, why is there genome coverage? What's the point of it, and why is it a good metric? And then, if we were to do some contamination analysis, there's you know 50% of the sample is staph aureus, 20% of staph is staph epi, and 25% is uh, uh, E. coli. And I want to want them to know how to interpret this result. Um, obviously, you know a very quick inference is staph epi is normal floor, so they know they've probably got some skin contamination, some uh, you know communal uh, sequences in there. But that's sort of some of the other things I'm looking for, other than here's a fast Q file, report out the serology. I want to really make sure they know what's going on in each step of the protocol in the reporting level. Or I'm going to give them a fake SNP tree and say, please interpret this tree for the epidemiologist so they have to know looking through here and some of the metadata. And this is a, a tree made using CLC Bio. Um, that I don't tell them that it's staph aureus, but they know through the metadata that it's staph aureus because I'm looking at spa type. Um, and I sort of list the number of steps and I sort of write up, have them write up a paragraph you would, you would send to the epidemiologist as an interpretation. Um, and then something I'm really proud of here that we started is something called an incidental findings committee. Um, it's one thing that CLIA 
uh, and other all labs sort of look for is you're looking for result A, but you found B. What do you do with B when no one asked you to look for B? And sequencing, you know, whole genome sequencing, you might actually find B and C and D and E and F. What do we do with that? So I modeled our program off of American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, and they stated that these 50, and this is all for cancer, um, these 57 mutations related to cancer, if you find them in whole exome sequencing, the laboratory is mandated to tell the report to the clinician, and then it's up to the clinician to figure out what to do with that results. So for us, uh, every year we sort of uh, have a committee together where we have laboratory and medical epidemiologists and epidemiologists, and we sort of recite sort of a paragraph in front of them, you know, hands raised and all this. Basically, it's, we won't analyze any human genetic sequences. Right now, we're just doing bacterial isolates. It's not a big issue, but when we move into metagenomics for, viral, for clinical viral samples, it might be an issue. So we just state up front, we're not going to analyze any human genetics. Um, and then we have automatic reporting of select agents. We have a list of mandatory notifiable genes and plasmids. And then the WHO priority pathogens list of February 2017. And this means sort of as we're running through these big, uh, and I'll have a picture of it coming up soon, these big software uh, workflows that we have in CLC Bio that report out all these different possibilities. If we find one of these things, we're going to take it out of the laboratory's hand and say, we're going to automatically notify whatever epidemiologist we have to notify in the state and say, this is what we found. I don't know what it means, but hey, by the way, I'm just letting you know sort of takes the burden off of us of reporting. Um, so these are some of our two major workflows that we use in CLC Bio. The one on the left is bacterial isolate analysis, and the one on the right is directly from federal CDC that we use for paratyphy B tartrate positivity. And this one's actually really neat because it eliminates seven days of biochemical uh, cultures that are needed to report out tartrate positivity. But the one on the left is the one that we major uh, that we use uh, pretty much consistently. And the way we built this, um, we do have a little bit of a, a two major pathways going through. One is looking for contamination, and the other is doing de novo assembly. And then, because I want to make it as easy as possible for the technicians in the lab to sort of run the report, run their analysis and get results, instead of making nine or ten or eleven different workflows. This workflow runs everything we could possibly want. And then if there's no data, it just reports out no data. So this workflow will do salmonella serology, vibrio serology, homophilus serology, Neisseria serology. We also look for resistance genes, virulence factors, plasmids. And a lot of these were built uh, basically using the ResFinder function in CLC Bio. And I just removed the database and changed the database it's looking at. So, for example, for the Neisseria meningitidis, since we already have a, a PC, we use PCR to serotype, I know what um, uh, reference sequences we use for the PCR. I just download the reference sequences and sort of uh, replace those, whatever genes that we're looking at. And then we did a, a validation for each of those databases, knowing that the, the rest of it worked. As we add a database, we just do a new validation just to the database. Um, and this is sort of a way we would report out tartrate um, positivity. So isolate XXX is tartrate positive uh, based upon genotypic testing. And then we go, and then we just sort of state HILA detected, SSGJ uh, detected, and then um, uh, uh, SMT mutation detected or not detected. And this is basically saying, and this is different than saying, you know, this sample is tartrate positive. We report these, and we really want to say based upon genotypic testing and not serotype testing because it's not really a serotype testing, it's more genotype testing. So when we were originally doing our, uh, our validations, we wanted to look at uh, in silico bacterial taxonomy, and this sort of is just sort of a summary of sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. And these organisms were chosen based upon how often we see them in the laboratory. So we're not going to put some weird things in there, but sort of the common things that we see in the lab. Same with E. coli serology. When we picked whatever serotypes we were going to use, we picked ones that were most likely to see in the state. And same with salmonella. Uh, CLC bio, interesting enough, you know, it doesn't report out this is the serotype of this. It reports out this is the, you know, uh, 
the best coverage found or the most, you know, uh, statistically significant, uh, you know, O antigen or H1 antigen or H2. So in the case of Salmonella, we'll take, we'll create a chart saying this is the top O, H1 and H2 antigen and the top accessory genes that are present. And then we'll go to the updated Kaufman white scheme and interpret it that way. Other uh, silico uh, subtyping is we threw in um, things for MLST typing, um, uh, Staphylococcus spa typing, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa serotyping, and same with virulence factors and resistance genes. We looked at MECA for MRSA, FDX1 and 2 for uh, sugar toxin expressing E. coli, and then KPC, which is a carbapenemine gene. Um, we did validate uh, whole genome sequencing of TB uh, uh, functional mutations at the lab. We do use CLC Bio for this. I know CLC Bio now has a updated point mutation analysis database for TB. I haven't really taken a look at this because I, I, we sort of validated this in in uh, uh, CLC Bio. Um, this validation, we used 24 in silico samples and seven actual known um, positives. And we compared our results to ResFinder, TS, TGS, uh, TB, and then microbe. And our database we built using a combination of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different databases. And down below, we report out how APHL suggests uh, reporting language for MTBC and mutations associated with drug resistance. So you're looking at the gene, um, the proper nomenclature uh, that's needed for the mutation, and then what re what um, uh, the resistance is actually. Eventually, we're going to go to uh, clinical virial metagenomics, where we're going to look at over 100,000 different viruses in either CSF or uh, respiratory swab. The respiratory swab is interesting, not that um, not in a public health sense, but we did get money to do that in another. Uh, uh, and another grant, so we're doing that. And everything's being done in CLC Bio. So we created a database in-house, and we removed phages and viroids, and uh, actually two other viruses, Torqueno, which is a uh, ubiquitous in people, and then Semliki Farris virus, which all of our samples have been contaminated with. And looking into it's actually, Semliki is used as a uh, uh, plasmid cloning vector backbone. So probably what happened years ago is one of our uh, Plasma positive controls got loose in the lab, so we're seeing in, in our samples as well. Um, we're shooting for a turnaround time of seven to 10 days, and it requires a unique lab report that I have not worked on yet, but everything uh, will be done through CLC Bio. And uh, what we're sort of, the way we're gonna report out results using CLC Bio is sort of like a, a, the Corona taxonomy chart, and then the, say, top four or five uh, viruses we find there, and we're then going to do reference sequence analysis on and sort of get a genome coverage, you know, both width and depth, and we have some very specific language on what actually constitutes a positive. In this case, it would be, it needs to be three non-overlapping samples of at least, uh, three non-overlapping reads of at least 100 base pairs a piece across the entire viral uh, genome to sort of call a positive. And this is equivalent to three real-time PCR tests targeting three different uh, uh, gene regions. Um, in the past, we've done whole genome sequencing. This is not using CLC bio, but um, when we received money to do sequencing for uh, the antibiotic resistance of the state, uh, we did find some interesting things out of there. We found a couple different KPCs. Um, some TEMs, some OXA9s, and interestingly for me, because I like vancomycin resistance, in an enterococcus, we found both VAN-A and VAN-B signal transduction pathways, not just one or two genes, but all genes involved in those transition, uh, transition transduction pathways. Uh, we have used this in, <coughs> in a uh, hospital-associated infection uh, outbreak setting. In this case, uh, what happened in this setting is a mom was screened for MRSA when she went into the hospital, was negative for MRSA, had children or had a, a, a gave birth, her children were negative for MRSA. She went to go visit her sick her sick mother in the in the uh, adult ICU who was positive for MRSA, came back and gave it to her 
to her new children, new uh, newborns, they became positive with MRSA. Whole genome sequencing showed this very specifically, and the infection control preventionists loved it because there was no denying the fact that this was the route of transmission, is that the mother went to go see the infected uh, grandmother of these, of these newborns, came back, she was, then was infected and then gave it to her, her children. Usually in these instances, it's like, okay, someone went somewhere and they got infected with MRSA and we can't really prove what happened. Here's a very specific case. And there were a couple different clusters in this as well. We also use this, I'll just briefly go over this slide. We actually use this as a demo for how we could use it for in a bioterrorism event, looking at the intentional, um, and this is just a drill, the intentional contamination of a milk supply. Um, so we, you know, we grabbed fake samples from you know, a, a school and a milk producing facility and what people had at home and some clinical isolates. We sort of showed this amongst the state through like a, a foodborne work group you know, using health inspection. I think the FBI, we also invited the FBI up from Federal Seed Car from Boston to sort of join in and see what they would have to say about some of the, the work we were doing. Some of the issues we do have uh, uh, when validating and even right now with our whole genome sequencing stuff on staff is that <clears throat> All of our data is not integrated with Starlins. It's all stored on a hard drive. And even our lab reports, it's really difficult in Starlins to develop some of these databases that are, you know, 10,000 cells large and then saying that the answer could be zero or it could be any combination of this database. The, the sysadmin and then the, uh, one of the techs who monitor the databases for, uh, you know, mo uh, routine updates are having a hard time trying to integrate it. So sort of we do everything offline and then just sort of uh, create a Word document with any of our results that we then attach to our official lab report. Um, this is all 100% uh, grant funded work. None of it is state funded. Um, so as long as we keep getting funds for the ELC and SEP grants, we sort of keep up Pulse Network. <laughs> and then going forward, we need to work with the EPIs, the epidemiologists and the ID doctors to determine what they would like to see on the viral metagenomic report. And I think that's all I have on the metagenomics references. So that's the quick lowdown on what we do here at the state. Um, I hope to have lots of questions. Hey, Nick, this is Kevin. <clears throat> that was a fantastic talk, man. I really appreciate that. And I honestly can't believe how long we've had staff be uh, without having you talk, considering how much work, yeah. groundwork you've done uh, that I think a lot of us could definitely benefit from. Um, yeah. I had a question about the workflows that you've already put together. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, that slide with two the, the two workflows there from CLC Workbench. Yeah. Are those things that you could readily share to other users who already have CLC Workbench? So it's like, that would definitely help us, for example, in Virginia, it's like, hey, we want to integrate this yep. workflow. Yeah, exactly, these two. Uh, is that something you could just share? Or could I just, yeah, I mean, I, maybe it's easy yeah. to just recreate that with the, the click button. Yeah, I could share it. So the, the, I was, uh, for the Paratype EB that came to, from federal CDC, I was talking to PulseNet with them. And I asked, you know, what else could we use um, whole genome sequencing for? And they said, well, we'll use it for paratype EB. I said, okay, I, you know, send me some files and I'll recreate in CLC Bio. And they actually use CLC Bio for that workflow. So oh, right. within yeah. five minutes, I had, I had all, the, all the files I need and the, um, the uh, workflow itself. And then it took, you know, you know, a week to validate if that. Oh, wow. And that's, uh, this is Sean. I have to make a note here that all the work here is supposed to it should be done at the CLC microbial genomic suite, right? Correct. It's not CLC yeah. genomic workbench. So you need to purchase right. separately uh, yep. for CLC genomic workbench and the micro microbial genomic uh, suite. And I don't remember the additional money you need to pay for, for that suite. Yep. Yeah, it was, it was, it was pricey up front. Um, and then there is a yearly fee, but it's, for, for us at the state, it works great because one, um, I'm never going to get a bioinformatician. Uh, there's no state line for it. There's no money for it. So I need something that people who just use, you know, like Word and Excel and, you know, web apps can use. Anything involved with coding I can't use because none of us are coders. We, you know, 
I'm a video game player. That's my limit of computer. <laughs> that's that's a really good point and i think a lot of labs are going to be in that similar position and that's why i think this is definitely a useful useful talk to show and, how yeah. we can use software like this to, to address that issue kevin uh, this yeah. is jonathan jacobs from uh uh Kyage, and i also wanted just to add a response to the pricing question so just for awareness we are a platinum sponsor of aphl um at, at Kyogen, and we actually provided uh, APHL with some preferred pricing uh, for not just our bioinformatics products, but I think the whole slew of other things as well. Um, so that's something you can look into, or if you want to, if you, someone on your team wants to reach out to me, if they have a, if they're curious about that, um, I can I can connect them up with that uh, information. Hey Jonathan, hey. this is um, DC PHL. So we have um, CLC, and it's the Microbial GX Pro. The product yeah. code is 832014. That's the correct <laughs> version, right? Yeah, that sounds like that's the, the Microbial Genomics Pro Suite. Yep. Yeah, okay. And uh, I don't know what our buy-in cost is, but I know our renewal was around 5,000. I don't know if that's APHL price or, yeah. Yeah. That like was that. about our price at, at Maine. Yep. Okay. And Nick, just uh, getting back to these workflows, this also yeah. includes the report building because I, I noticed there was also I think what's really important to have on the reports that are shared with EPIs is like the language of how it was built and, and even like the limitations or like legal clauses yeah. that, that might need to be included that's all done in CLC as well no so we build like the um, the any any language that's needed for disclaimers or limitations uh, we put into um, our our CLIA signed uh, uh, protocol and then it's, okay. those those are either some things are built into our limb system and are pre pre uh, populated otherwise in our like artificially built word document that's a lab report we built in uh, uh, limitations and disclaimers we can pull up um, so we just have each section I, I can show that offline or, or give an example of everything okay. that we could possibly put in a lab report and then it's all just pre-populated depending on what you want to want to add okay thank you nick yep. hey nick uh this is sean again from minnesota um two quick questions uh you mentioned that uh you know lots of assays has been pre-evaluated including the, the, the stereotyping for salmonella e coli uh, antibiotic resistant various factors um and uh, so so do you use like uh, a gigantic SOP to uh, and, and the validation report to 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 conclude them them all, or you tackle yeah. them one assay by one assay? <clears throat> you, you use one to tackle them all. No, so each um, each individual like uh, if you look at the bacterial isolate workflow, each individual. Um, uh, Zero group or zero, you know, in silico serotyping or antibiotic resistance portion has its own section in our large bioinformatics SOP of how to report out what you need to look for, what QA and QC needs to be uh, uh, performed for each. Okay, um, and and for your, um, for example, like virulence factors or uh, antibiotic resistant genes. Um, yeah. Do you find like large discordance between um, um, phenotypic information versus genotypic information that uh, create some difficulties during your validation? Um, I would assume, for example, for the antibiotic resistant, you use the uh, uh, the phenotypic data as your gold standard, right? Right. So um, the way we validated, say, our antibiotic resistance um, work is we went back to the bank of uh, about 500 samples we had sequenced before and had and had genotypic data and then we re resequenced uh, maybe I don't know 50 to 60 of those and we needed to match our previous data and I knew and we also had phenotypic data for each of those as well so like the anything MRSA I knew they were oxacillin or methicillin uh, resistant so I would I expect to see uh, you know uh, MECA or we had when we were doing drone factors I know 
E. coli 015787 has sugar toxin genes, so I need to see either sugar toxin 1 or 2, depending on what our PCR had. I also, um, to save on costs and to increase the, 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 um, the validity of our workflows, is we sort of have two, two different validations going at the same time. The entire workflow from, you know, like frozen down isolate, Nextera XT, Illumina sequencing, bioinformatics SOP, uh, that gets a validation. But then we all then just take FASTQ files and then further validate just the bioinformatics portion of it. <clears throat> So we have, you know, like 30 to 40 samples doing the entire process and then maybe another 20 to 30 samples just doing whatever new bioinformatics workflow I'm validating. And, and you're sequencing some cases, SOP start from, from what, from the uh, extracted and quantified DNA? Uh, yeah, wherever the, the pulse, we follow the pulse net pretty much for everything we do. Um, so it's really it could start from, you know, like a single colony or um, multiple sub, you know, on selective media colony. Okay. And, and you validate just one library prep kit or um, you... Uh, we, we just did Nextera XT. And then we okay. would, when we went to validate those, we would say, mm -hmm. you know, and then we validated the, you know, the 300 cycle kit, the 500 cycle kit, different lots on different machines different days, different sample preps, uh, four different uh, uh, technicians. <clears throat> yeah, and, so and, and, and if you want to switch to the flex, then I would assume there will be another sort of like a revalidation yeah. or verification. Yeah, so, so uh, we finally have money uh, to do, uh, to validate the flex kit, and that will require a full validation because it's one of the first steps now, say if we were just validating a different database, I'm not. I'm not going to go back and revalidate Nextera XT for that database. I already have, I already know that my extraction works, and I'm getting good genome coverage. I just need to know is the data coming out good for that that database. Okay. So when we do when we do our validations, we validate each individual database. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Nick, yeah. this is Jonathan. Um, now it's, would it be all right if I asked a question? Yeah, go for it. Um, the, so one of the questions I had written down here, when you and a great talk, by the way, or, um, it's, it's really impressive, actually, what you've been able to do with the software. Um, the, the, you had mentioned that if the, like, the de novo assembler version changed, you would have to go back and revalidate your pipeline, which I totally get that. Um, yep. And if, if your lab protocol hasn't changed at all, is that really just a matter of rerunning the same data that you already had mm -hmm. used in your original validation and making sure that the same yep. threshold and criteria are met? Yes. Okay. Yep. So we, would, we, have, we have stored on our external hard drives the original validation FASTQ <laughs> files. That's great. And they're linked to whatever version we use. And we would just go back and make sure that we're getting the same quality of data out. Perfect. So that just basically underscores the importance of holding on to that data. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah. So we, we have, um, you know, any lab report that goes out and then any of our QA stuff, it all has version, you know, version numbers associated with it. Not that I can go back to the old versions, but I know what version it was, it was completed under. Jonathan, can you actually talk about that software update aspect? Because I think that's going to be a concern too, is like making sure if, if we have a system that we can always go back to before the update would happen. Is that something that, that is an option for CLC users? If like, for example, the de novo assembler gets updated, do we still have access to the older version? Yeah, so um, if, if, if uh, anyone who's got the software that's under current maintenance license or um, under a subscription license to the software is entitled to any version that's available um, previously. Now we only actively um, address bugs in the software because as you might imagine, it's a very large tool set. There's a lot of tools, things happen, right? Things get fixed. Um, we only address bugs in the current version and the previous version. Um, so if you validate a pipeline in let's say version seven, um, and now you're on version 12, 
and and uh, you want to go back to version seven, that's great. We can do that. We can provide you with the uh, the executables to to use the older version of the workbench. But if you find a bug in that version of version seven, uh, where it's it would have to it would it would be uh, there would have to be a really really strong business case for me to decide to open up the code and fix it because uh, it's you know it's just one of those things where. Um, we can't be going back to the previous versions and, and fixing those branches, if you will, in the, in the code base. Um, Understood completely. Yeah. But the other thing to keep in mind also is, and this has come up a, a couple of times with some other customers that are using CLC in a clinical context, is um, they'll develop and validate a pipeline, let's say in Genomics Workbench 11, and they don't upgrade to version 12 or the next version, which is coming out in a month or so, which is version 20 and that's a I know it's a big jump of numbers but we just decided to align with the year number <laughs> um, and and it's because they think they can only have one version running on their workstation or something at a time and actually for each major version release it actually gets installed in its own completely separate uh, install base on your file system so you can actually have multiple major versions of CLC actually coinciding side by side um, yep. without without too many issues Actually, without any issues, as far as I know. Yeah, thanks for that insight. Yeah. Any other questions for Nick? Uh, yeah, I, I, oh, yeah, go ahead. I have a question for Nick. So looking at uh, your table one, you had um, your sensitivity, specificity, accuracy. Um, yeah, it's in silico bacterial taxonomy. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's the one. Um, so things like so traditional things that like really we struggle yeah. with with WGS like LOD and interference. Yeah. Do you just how did you handle that with your quality team? Yeah, so some of the things, you know, like when when you know already that it's a E. coli in the sense that it's either going to be E. coli or not. So we sort of changed the wordings around and called it concordance to previous data or something, you know, along those lines. Um uh, and then for LODs weren't really done because we're using, you know, like uh, 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 whole bug. It's not like I want to know the gene concentration over time after antibiotic treatment. It's I know this is I know this is E. coli or I know it's one isolate grown up to you know a specific concentration that PulseNet has identified. So I, I and I when I I I don't have the definitions up here of what we gave CLIA for sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. I can look those up for you because they're, they're sort of misnomers in this case. They're more like, is the data concordant with previous data, yes or no? So those definitions would be very helpful. And then um, okay. yes. my last question about, so we were thinking possibly for interference, like doing some like mixed cultures. Did you guys address yep. interference or what did you um, do? Uh, so for interference, we didn't in this case because I'm not mixing, say, two different species together and then trying to get them back out. It's sort of this is, you know, sample one is E. coli, sample two is salmonella. So in that case, if you wanted to think about um, not on the bioinformatics side, but when you're setting up your, uh, your, your Illumina indexes is rotating your indexes so there's no cross-contamination between those. And Clea was Clea was fine with that. Okay, so just you established that you rotate indices to you know yep. alleviate any cross contamination, and they didn't yep. ask for any interference study beyond that. No. Okay, great. Thank you. No. Yep. Yeah, it was. It we we sort of the way we designed our QA manual is, if I was an auditor coming in not knowing anything, I'm going to ask. All the standard things we're going to ask for, say, clinical chemistry and traditional bacteriology. And we came up with, I don't know, an entire manual's worth and sort of tried to address them up front and just have them available to say, I know what your questions are going to be. I'm going to take you through our workflow. And if you have a question to ask, I'm just going to go down the list. And at parts where I think you're going to have a question, I'm going to sort of like preemptively answer the auditor with an an, you know with, with my answer saying i know you're going to ask how do you control version i'm going to write down this is how i control version or how do you make sure in this 
sampled where you have 12 different individual samples mixed together in culture, how do you know that they're not, you know, sample one in your pipeline is not being mixed with sample two? And so we went in, in depth about the chemistry behind the purpose of the indices and the adapters in the next era workflow and why we rotate, rotate them throughout and why we wash and record when we wash, you know, each individual instrument and those sorts of things. Thank you. That's super helpful. Yeah, you're welcome. So this is Joel. I have a comment here. And, and first, Nick, that was an incredible talk. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, you're welcome. And you know, the, a lot of us on this call are part of you know the Biomedics Regional Resource or Workforce Development, you know, funded through AMD. You know, we're promoting bioinformatics capability in our respective regions. And what I think is really great about this talk is when it comes to NGS and innovation and validation, we, we tend to think about, you know, the, the bigger labs. We think of, of Wadsworth and Minnesota, um, or those that have the, the special expertise, you know, Virginia and Utah, you know, California. And then, and here, what's great about this is you, you have a small lab um, in Maine. They don't have a bioinformaticist. Nick will admit that he's not a bioinformaticist. And yet they have leaped out probably ahead of everybody that I know of in validating and implementing NGS and expanding it. And they're, I think that they're really innovating a lot more on the implementation side than, you know, others can argue with me, but I, I think that we, we've just seen that he's a step ahead of just about everybody on this call. And, you know, this, this might not be a solution for everyone, but this could be a solution for a lot of the labs in our region, especially smaller labs that can't afford a bioinformaticist. And, and this isn't something that's going to take the place of bioinformaticists because, you know, there's always the, the, the cutting edge technologies that have to be incorporated and validated. You know, there's always the, the odd outbreaks and really diving in and using new technologies, trying to compare chromosomal versus plasmid based, et cetera. But for your routine, um, you know, identification and characterization, you know, some of these solutions can be uh, particularly useful, um, especially for the smaller labs. So I, I don't think Nick has an appreciation right now for how busy he's about to become. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have to uh, wait until after January because it's simply a <laughs> SOP review time. But I, I think Nick has, has opened the door here on something and started to create a, a tremendous resource for this community. So thank you, Nick. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, feel free to contact me with questions about QA or QC um, that we're doing. Uh, you know, we, we have a, a pretty good, uh, actually an excellent QA officer that has sort of taken what we've done before and sort of even increased the amount of QA and QC that we do, which is, you know, some people don't like, but when you can either further prove to your auditor or your, your clinician to say, I know my data is, I'm highly confident in my data, I know it's correct because of these reasons, you know, it makes, it makes the data look a lot better. Yeah, definitely uh, couldn't agree more with what Joel said. I think you've, you've revealed yourself as a little subject matter expert here on how to get this to, to implementation here, Nick. So I really appreciate that. Um, I did have another question though too. So with your use of CLC, especially with the enterics, how does that uh, blend with your use of bionumerics? Um, uh, we use bionumerics solely to push sequencing data or you know the FASTQ files to federal CDC, we don't do anything else with it. Oh, wow, okay. So, okay. So then it's still and in the national database. database. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, we'll, any, any, any sequencing data we get, we'll, we'll use whatever protocol they want to, you know, throw it on there, but we don't, we don't report any data. We don't store any data from there. Um, even though uh, Clio doesn't care so much about some of that data, the way our QA manual is written that anything we do, even rabies, which is animals, we assume that at some point CLIA is going to take a look at it. So we hold everything to a CLIA standard. And the reason why we don't go down the bionumerics route for doing any of this is I don't have version control. If I don't have version control, I kind of don't want to use it. 
and I don't have specific protocols on how to use that software. TLC Bio, I really wrote out, click this button, click that button, do this, and I don't have them for federal CDC. Yeah, that's a really important point you bring up there with the version controlling. And that was even you know addressed there in the chat. Um, and, and all those SOPs, are those things that you are willing to, to make public or at least distribute to the staff B community? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask our lab director to see how much he's willing to sort of share. I, I'm sure he'll share all of it. But that is I'll great just, news. I'll just him. And Nick, do you have any, uh, any plans to publish this work at all? Um, I don't know. I know that's not your main mission, but I mean, you have to, yeah. you know, I'm curious, of course. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to try and, and maybe uh, have a poster at the ELC conference this year. This is the, the ELC governance team meeting. Uh, it's the first year that they have posters. There's only 10, so I don't know what I'm going to do. It's going to be sort of really fancy. If I can get metagenomics up and running, uh, which so far is working uh, pretty well. We have the protocol all set and we're going to start like in-depth validations in probably the next month. Oh, awesome. Jonathan has plans for publishing it though. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know, I know he does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Nick, this is probably a silly question, but for your all your metagenomics work, that's to the Illumina platform, correct? Oh yeah, everything's Illumina, everything's next uh, 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 next era XT. Because we're actually doing a, um, a virome respiratory pipeline through the ION S5. So I was just, um, maybe I'll keep in touch and share what we're doing with you. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. And the reason why I know there's other, other ways we could go about it, but we had money, we, you know, we got money to buy all this, uh, everything, all the reagents and everything using Nextera XT. We actually also use Kyogen's Replige kit for um, random amplification of DNA and RNA. Uh, for that step as well. Hey Nick, this is Greg in Delaware. Just piggybacking off yeah. of Kevin, uh, because you know, as a PulseNet lab, you're required to use bionumerics. Have you done a side-by-side -side comparison with your CLC data and bionumerics data just to see if there's any discrepancies? Because if we're using you know bionumerics to represent cluster outbreaks nationally, mm -hmm. interesting to see if there's right. any. Yeah, so the, the only thing that, would, that we would compare would be E. coli and salmonella serology. And we've gone through, we've had those up validated for three years, so that's at least six PTs. So all of our PTs have been, been correct um, through PulseNet, and then we also do any PTs that we get for, uh, through CAP or Wisconsin for traditional bacteriology because you have to treat every sample like you would a real sample. So if they send a salmonella, we have to do serology. We do whole genome sequencing on that, PT as well. Um, we haven't seen any issues so far. We well, haven't really looked back by that. Would you do a, an outbreak, like an enteric outbreak using CLC or would you refer to bionumerics data for like a um, so, tree? Yeah, so, so for, for local clusters, so we'll do um, uh, SNP tree analysis. We're a low incident state, so we get 200 salmonella max a year, and most of those are not related at all. They're just sort of one-off samples here or there. Um, but we also have only one foodborne epidemiologist. So while we all agree we will defer to federal CDC for the official report that comes out six months later, um, uh, he really needs to know today are these two samples related or are those two samples related because he's a, he's a uh, department of one. Same here. Yeah. So we, we use it in that function is that I can tell you, you know, we'll go whatever federal CDC and PulseNet says, we'll go with that as, as the gold standard. But today I can tell you that outbreak over at that church, you want to investigate that and not these, you know, loss that aren't related at all. Thank you. Yeah, this is Jonathan. If I can just add a, a small comment about that, as far as the typing uh, for epidemiology outbreaks, um, one of the things that was a major goal for me when I joined the team at Kaijin a year and a half ago was to kind of close the gap on our capabilities to support clinical microbiology labs. And in about three weeks, actually maybe two weeks, soon in December before Christmas, 
um, <laughs> we'll be uh, releasing another major update to the platform that will include CGMLST and whole genome MLST typing uh, and connectivity with the public databases that have the schemas. And I know some of those are not congruent with bionumerics uh, typing schemas, depending on which bug you're looking at. But um, my expectation is presumably there should be a substantial amount of overlap. If, if that's your preferred method is if you don't, you know, for whatever reason, SNP, SNP typing or KMER based approaches doesn't um, doesn't work for you. The the uh, MLST approaches, uh, traditional MLST is available now, and CGMLST and whole genome MLST is going to be um, in a couple of weeks. And the the new uh, minimum spanning tree graphic uh, visualization tools actually it's just it's gorgeous actually. So, but um, anyway, yeah, just wanted to just just wanted to put that out there so you're aware. That's one of the major differences between the platforms right now is that CGMLST is not. Uh, part of the current release of CLC, but in a few weeks that'll be over. Is anyone but from PulseNet on the call by chance and maybe speak about the, the release of those whole genome MLST schemes? Maybe not. Um, if not, that's all right. Um, we are uh, getting pretty close to the to the top of the hour, um, so yeah, definitely wanted to thank Nick. Uh, definitely thanking Jonathan as well for for being able to answer so many questions about CLC. But Nick, definitely huge thanks for all the work you've done. Um, it, yeah, it's like I said uh, at the end of your talk earlier. I can't believe how much uh, how long it's taken for us to get you to speak in front of staff. B, I think this is going to be super helpful. Um, and then Jonathan, I think you mentioned uh, an opportunity for. Uh, early career scientists that, that you wanted to throw out to the group as well? Yeah, I'm sorry, I was on mute. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so it's not official yet, but um, we are launching a uh, early career scientists award for antimicrobial resistance genomics in uh, 2020. The official announcement will probably come in January. And what that is um, uh, going to entail is uh, if, if any of you we're aware of like the last few years we've had like an annual microbiome scientist of the year award where people submit abstracts um, we have an external panel not at kaijin review them uh, from, a, from a sort of scientific uh, impact perspective um, and then we make an award uh, to that to the scientist um, and in the for the AMR early career uh, award for um, antimicrobial resistance genomics uh, It'll be uh, licenses for the CLC platform, as well as a license for our uh, CLC Genomics Cloud Engine um, that runs on Amazon AWS. Uh, and there's also gonna be a $5,000 um, training and AWS kind of um, credit, if you will, or, or grant uh, associated with that. So that way for folks that are sort of going into bioinformatics and are looking to train up, on the use of the cloud for their analysis, then then it's a great way to um, to get that training paid for. All right, thank you, Jonathan. I think there's yeah. definitely a lot of people on this call, especially the uh, the CDC bioinformat APHL bioinformatics fellows that, that would likely be interested in an opportunity like that. And then Nick, if you have uh, a couple of time, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording, but we can save a couple of 10, 15 minutes for people to ask questions if that's cool with you. Okay, yeah, sure. All right, and for everybody else, thank you guys for another great staff B call. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now.